Hey folks, today I'm going to talk a bit about virtual tabletops, VTTs, and whether you need them. But first, since it's been a while since my last video, some recent reflections. First of all, I recently ran a one-shot of my homebrew Cortex Prime game in person at a friend's place. And I realized that as much as I love playing online, it was really fun to roll some physical dice in person and enjoy some snacks and drinks. So I'm looking forward to more in-person gaming again, hopefully soon. On a related note, I'm also feeling an itch to GM more regularly again. I'm not GMing anything on a regular basis right now, aside from the occasional one-shot. I might try to get a regular game going again, maybe Easy D6, DCC, Warlock or Warpstar, and later this year, once I've made my way through the book, perhaps Vason. Also, GameholeCon has been on my mind. Uh, I'm all set to attend again this year in October for the second time. Uh, I'll actually be running a game this time as well, Night of Blood, which is a classic Warhammer fantasy roleplay adventure, but I'll be running it using the lightweight Warlock system. So come and look for my game if you happen to be there as well. I've run this a bunch of times and I think it's really fun. All right, let's jump into our main topic, VTTs. So first of all, what is a VTT? Uh, and again, it stands for Virtual Tabletop and that's more or less what it is. It replaces a physical tabletop so you can play online. What exactly that means varies quite a bit from one VTT to the other, but there are some basic expectations. In most cases, you can expect support for maps and tokens, character sheets and dice rolling. Beyond that, they can focus on different types of experiences. Some VTTs might aim for a highly immersive tactical experience that's all about dragging tokens around on a map and seeing new areas revealed with fancy lighting and perhaps sounds and such. Other VTTs can be more basic or perhaps geared towards more narrative systems such as Fate that are more about index cards and Fate points rather than tactical maps. Taking a step back, why would we consider using a VTT in the first place? Obviously, it's to facilitate playing online, and there are many reasons that you might want to do that. Of course, the recent pandemic is a prime example. In fact, this prompted a lot of progress in this space, with many groups flocking online to continue their games when playing in person was no longer an option. But playing online is also a great way to play with distributed groups. Some of my best games have been with players in many locations, even multiple countries. This in turn makes it much easier to find or organize niche games where it might be harder to drum up enough interest in your town. There are many other reasons why people might want to play online, whether exclusively or in addition to in-person gaming. This might even make gaming accessible to people that are unable to play in person for various reasons. Perhaps they have a disability that makes this difficult, or they might live in a really remote rural area. Anything that gets more people into the hobby is a great thing in my mind. I should note that online play isn't the only reason to use VTTs. Some groups like to use VTTs in person around the table, for example, to display battle maps. That's not a use case that I'll cover in this video though. All right, let's jump into a brief overview of uh, some of the VTTs out there. This is not meant to be an exhaustive overview. There's lots of info on this in other videos already. So just do a YouTube search and you know, you'll find uh, all kinds of details. I just want to convey a rough sense of the types of VTTs out there and what they're good at. All right, let's start with a classic, Fantasy Grounds. This is the granddaddy of VTTs and has been around since 2004, so almost two decades. It's a traditional desktop app, whereas all the other VTTs that I'll mention later are web apps running in the browser. It's a single purchase, so there are no ongoing hosting fees, so that part is pretty attractive. You may need to fiddle a little bit with port forwarding though, if you wanna post this on your local network. A big caveat up front, I never actually used Fantasy Grounds myself to run anything, so I can't really explain things in great detail. Although ironically, I did implement a Fantasy Grounds extension to roll up 
level zero DCC characters. Uh, let me show you, in fact, my little gong farmer generator. So here I have the DCC rule set loaded up. If I go to characters, we don't have any right now. And uh, my extension basically adds this um, random generator button here. So you click it and boom, you get a level zero character. It's got a random name, Lago Ellis, and, uh, or Iago, I guess, that should be an I. A dwarven uh, apothecarist. There's some random stats. Uh, they should have some inventory, so a backpack, a cudgel, and a steel vial. Let's make one more just because it's fun. Now we have Graham Roland. Uh, he is an armorer and he's got, um, okay, some, some rations, an iron helmet, and a hammer. Yeah, but these should be complete level zero characters. They have a, a lucky roll, right? So this one is struck by lightning. Their luck affects reflex saving throws, for example. Just a little uh, side note on this. Fantasy Grounds gives you uh, the full DCC rule set if you purchase it inside this application. So you can review the character classes, for example. So if you forget how the cleric abilities work, you can just pull up the cleric right here and read through how all of, how all of this stuff works. You can see uh, their abilities, you can see their uh, level progression here and how it affects their um, to hit chance and things like that. So that's pretty convenient and similarly you can look up occupations and all kinds of other rules. Uh, and then you can also purchase individual modules. Uh, Goodman Games actually makes quite a few modules available. So here for example we have uh, the classic Sailors on the Starless Sea and uh, all the stuff from the module is in here in digital form. Uh, you got your maps and encounters are all started out, NPCs, spells, you know, the whole story. So I can pull up a, a, a map here. Let's go with the Ruined Keep and we'll go with the player version that actually omits some spoilers that are on the GM visible map. So here we go. I just tap this button here and now uh, it, it's, it's visible up here on the screen. Let's close these windows. Uh, one feature I really like in here that I wish all VTTs had is the simple um, fog of war. So I can enable this mask and now it's basically masked out. As a GM, I can still see this, you know, sort of uh, grayed out version of the map. The players just wouldn't be able to see this at all. I think it would just be black. And then as the characters explore the map, I can just gradually make it visible. So let's say they walk up here, right? And now they make their way through this gate. I can show this and then they start exploring the courtyard. And so it's really easy to just, uh, you know, gradually re reveal the map um, area by area. Couple other notes. There is quite a bit of a learning curve um, in, in my opinion. The tool is very powerful. And from everything I've heard, uh, once you master it, um, it's going to be a really efficient way for you to run things, right? But it, it does take a little bit of dedication to, to get to that point. I also find that the UI is very old school. It, it feels distinctly 90s. There are lots of, you know, these kinds of win windows all over the place that you can individually drag around and, and close. And again, it, it's pretty functional and there's all kinds of themes to make it look however you want but it's not necessarily super modern. And last not least, I do feel that it's distinctly geared towards games with battle maps and tokens, although there is support for other types of games in there as well. And there's a ton of extensions from the community as well as, as, well as official ones. So you can really customize it to, to what you want. Next up, we have Roll20. This is one of the original web-based VTTs. It came out in 2012. So it's almost 11 years old. Roll20 is a hosted service, so there's nothing to set up on your end. You just need a browser to access it. Roll20 supports many games, um, and it's more or less oriented around character sheets. So you pick your character sheet when creating a game. For this game, for example, I picked the D&D uh, 5e character sheet, which is actually pretty well done. So if you pull up an example here, uh, for now, I will just edit the sheet directly. 
and I uh, can make this a little bit bigger. I find the dark mode not as nice. There's a light mode as well that I could switch to. Uh, but anyways, this looks pretty much like your paper uh, 5e sheet, right? And so it's pretty intuitive to use. Um, you can, yeah, there's some other stuff here that's more sort of behind the scenes. Um, you don't really need to mess with that. You can put in a bio for your character, but really this is the main place you're gonna be working with. And then you can trigger die rolls from here uh, and, and all of that. Support for maps is pretty solid. Um, there's basic fog of war support, similar to what I showed for fantasy grounds, but you can also set up, you know, lighting and, and other fancy effects. The UI feels a little bit clunky to me, although I admit that that might be subjective. It's also not super flexible. There are many features which should be enough to support most games. It's just not very customizable. We'll see some VTTs later that really allow you to dial in the experience that you want. In terms of uh, pricing, this is a freemium model, so basic support is free, and that's what you need for most things, but uh, you can upgrade uh, and pay in order to get access to, to more features. There's also a built-in voice and video chat. In the past, when I've tried this, this felt unreliable, so we usually ended up using Discord in parallel, but it's possible that this has gotten better recently, so I, I, I can't really speak to that. Um, one thing I like about Roll20 is that um, it has matchmaking features built in, so they have a way where you can uh, submit games, uh, look at where you're looking for players, other players can browse those games, uh, and I have actually found games through the system in the past, so that's a, that's a nice value add. Next up, we have Foundry VTT. This is my current VTT of choice when I need a VTT, but there are some major caveats that I'll get to in a little bit. Foundry itself is a web app, similar to Roll20. However, this can be hosted either locally or in the cloud. The app itself is a single purchase, and players never have to pay, only the GM. For example, you can run it locally on your desktop, just like Fantasy Grounds, and have your players connect to your local machine via their browser. This does require setting up port forwarding and all that stuff, and of course they can only access it when the app is running on your desktop. Alternatively, there are some very convenient cloud hosting providers, the most prominent one being The Forge, that's what I'm using here. Um, depending on the plan, you pay about four to twelve dollars a month, um, and again, only the GM needs to pay. So more money gives you more storage and some additional capabilities. This makes it a lot easier for players to access the game anytime as well. So if you can afford it, that's that's a strongly recommended way. If you're you know into technology, uh, it's easy to set it up as well on your own cloud server or, or anywhere else really. Foundry has great game support. It comes with 5e, but there are many game systems provided either by the respective publishers or by the community, including lesser known systems like EZD6 or Warlock. In practice, it usually just takes a little while when a new system comes out for somebody who's passionate enough to, to build a game system for it. So that's been really nice. There are also tons of modules that allow you to dial in the exact experience you want. For example, there is a module called Dice So Nice that gives you 3D dice. So without that, you just get you know, basic uh, dice in the chat. But uh, with this module, um, when you roll dice, you get, yeah, let me just roll a couple of D12s here, because why not? and we get some nice dice. And you can actually customize these in the settings in all kinds of ways. There's various themes and so on. So everybody can kind of add their own unique little flair to the, to the game. Uh, it's not quite as nice as physical dice, but uh, it comes pretty close. They have a content marketplace as well that allows you to purchase game systems or game content. So for example, you can buy DCC modules and Savage Worlds settings and adventures and things like that. Foundry also has voice and video chat built in. I've actually never used it. I'm just so used to using Discord in parallel. So that's uh, what I've been doing. So I can't really speak to the quality there. So here, for example, I've loaded up the Savage Worlds rule set. I added a, uh, a Western map here. Here I'm showing off 
um, the uh, simple fog module, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that allows me to unveil um, areas as the players explore it. So for example, like this, and now I can unveil, you know, this building, this graveyard here, and so on. You have your combat tracker, you can set up a bunch of scenes ahead of time, uh, and then actors, that's your characters. The character sheet looks pretty much like the, the paper one, so that's pretty nice for Savage Worlds. Um, you can go through all these different tabs, see their weapons and everything. You can do die rolls. So let's say I want to do, I didn't actually add any, any numbers here, so that's not going to work right now. But uh, trust me, uh, if, if I had set this up properly, I'd, I'd be able to click on it and do any, any die rolls like this. Or you can just do die rolls by typing in here or using this, which is another module that allows me to just, you know, add um, any dice I want. Say I want to roll 4d6, I can just uh, easily do that. And there's my 4d6. The overall UI structure is very similar to what we saw for roll 20, uh, with kind of a tabbed interface here on the right, and then kind of your, your tools on the left, uh, and the chat box here as well. Now there are some caveats. So Foundry is very much geared towards playing with fancy battle maps and tokens. There is support for Fog of War, but this normally assumes that you have walls and lighting configured for each map. It's not hard to do, but it does take quite a bit of prep time. And it also assumes a certain type of experience. As I mentioned in previous videos, I generally prefer theater of the mind but I still like to show an overhead map and gradually reveal this as the players explore it. This can be achieved with community created modules, such as the simple fog module I mentioned earlier, but these can be flaky and they have a tendency to break for extended periods of time after major foundry version upgrades. So it's not great to rely on these. This particular feature is apparently on the roadmap, but with no specific commitments about if or when it will be added. And since the core user base tends to use Foundry for fancy battle maps, the priority for features like Simple Fog of War is relatively low. Another artifact of being biased towards battle maps and tokens is that tracking initiative requires adding tokens to the map and then from there to the encounter. And I don't generally use or need tokens when playing Theater of the Mind. So it's just a little bit of a convoluted and unnecessary workflow. Um, again, it's, it's not a huge deal. You can easily work around it, um, but it does feel a bit cumbersome. There are also some surprising gaps in the core feature set. For example, if you wanna show the other players where you are, you need a, another module. It's a little hard to see with my color scheme here, but uh, this, this purple here, uh, I had to add a module called pings to make that possible. It's not um, part of the default experience. So it feels relatively minor, but you know you do need to add a bunch of modules um, until you really get uh, what I would consider a good baseline experience. So while Foundry is my VTT of choice, I only break it out when I really do need that VTT experience. I'll talk about some alternative approaches soon, but first let's look at a couple more VTTs. Here we have a tool called Owlbear Rodeo. This is a great lightweight option when you really just need the occasional map and um, yeah, maybe not even for your whole game. One nice thing about Owlbear Rodeo is that players don't even need to sign up or anything. You can simply create uh, your game in here. It gives you a random URL. Um, which you can simply copy and you know share with your players and they just need to pull it up in their browser and they're in. Uh, so it can't get easier than that. Um, and then there's support for maps and tokens. So for example, I can go here and uh, I have a couple maps like uh, you know grass, sand, stone. This is a map I uploaded previously, so I could easily upload my own maps. But uh, it's also super easy to just sketch something out. Um, so say you're playing more of an improv game and uh, your players are um, somewhere outdoors in the wilderness and they're about to be ambushed by, by goblins. Uh, I could add this grass map here. Uh, so here we are. 
Now I go to the drawing tool and let's say we have a, a stream that, that flows through here. So I can just sort of, you know, draw it like this, um, maybe this. And then uh, let's say we have some, some trees growing. Let's just make those, um, this bright green, Put some circles here to symbolize those trees. Right, got a bunch of trees here. And maybe we have some, some boulders that uh, those um, goblins are hiding behind. So let's make those orange. And again, I'll use this, right? So we have like a boulder here and maybe another one over here. And uh, then we can drag some tokens in there. So we have those evil mischievous goblins in here somewhere, uh, I think. No, that's a dragon. Uh, where are my goblins hiding? Oh, down here. There we go. There's a goblinoid. So we can just, you know, let's say, let's say there's one sort of popping out from behind there and the other ones are kind of hiding. Something like this. And then if we wanted to, we could put our players up here as well. There's various generic tokens. So you can have like a, a barbarian or a cleric and things like that. Uh, here's a monk. Um, there's also all kinds of weird tokens, like, you know, money, like maybe there's a treasure here. Maybe, maybe the goblins put out a little treasure to lure the players in. And then as they come to pick up the treasure, they jump out from behind that boulder or whatever. Anyways, so that's really all you need. And uh, boom, you're good to go. So really nice, you know, for just the occasional battle map experience. There's also support for Fog of War. I should note that a version 2 of Owlbear Rodeo is in beta now. I think it's about to come out actually next month, I think. So it'll, it'll replace version 1 soon. There are some significant changes, but I haven't um, used it myself, so I can't really uh, speak to it in detail. Uh, I think they're adding a subscription model as well. I'm not sure if that's going to be optional or not. There are many other VTTs that I don't have time to cover in detail now. I'll just briefly mention a couple more. Here we have Alchemy. This is still very new and not quite completed yet. They recently finished a very successful Kickstarter. Alchemy aims to provide an immersive audiovisual experience. And while battle maps will be supported, that's not the focus here. You can add images, overlay weather effects, play music, and sounds and create really immersive scenes. Again, it's still early days, but um, based on the Kickstarter, they have plans to support many games, including a ton of the Free League games. Games like Vason seem like a great match for this type of VTT. Uh, so this is definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, I'll just show a couple of examples. This is a example game that, that they set up that you can load up to get a, a sense for how this system works. So here's one scene, here's another one. So you can kind of see some animation effects and birds flying in the distance and, and stuff. Um, so there's no battle map. It just sort of gives you a nice vibe of what this, this scene might look like or feel like. Uh, there's some NPCs here that I can look at. So there's a bandit. Uh, let's look at this bandit, right? So we see their stats. This is um, 5e. And um, I think you can trigger roles from here and, and things like that. Let's go to one more scene, this bookshop scene. Here I have some NPCs. So we can, let's look up Fawn Lee, our medium humanoid. Um, so here she is, uh, again, with all the stats. Worth keeping an eye on. I can't really speak to it in, in any details. Uh, actually, let's try a die roll here just to see what that looks like. Okay, so the dice kind of show up here in the, in the chat bar. Uh, so pretty, pretty basic, but uh, seems to work fine. Uh, and there's notes as well that you can take. Next, we have roll. This is at playroll.com. This seems like a very flexible VTT that supports many games as well. I've heard that the built-in voice video chat is supported to be really solid. So they're really trying to offer everything in one application. So if that 
works as well as I'm hearing, that could be a really nice um, tool as well. I haven't really used this for anything. I loaded up a map here. Uh, it's got you know a lot of the same basic elements that we can recognize from, from other VTTs. One of the things I find a little bit weird is how character sheets, regardless of system, are relegated to this narrow sidebar on the left here. So here, here we have Ezra Voidhide, this uh, human fighter character, and uh, yeah, you kind of have this form-based uh, character sheet UI. Uh, so all this stuff is in here. Uh, I'm sure it works fine. It's just sort of a little bit of a weird, very narrow presentation that requires a lot of vertical scrolling. Here we have another VTT that's called Let's Roll, not to be confused with roll or play roll. So this lives at letsroll.com. Uh, so a pretty confusing name. Uh, they ran a Kickstarter a couple years ago. Uh, they've been in beta since uh, 2022 and are heading towards a stable release. I've been holding off checking it out until the stable release comes out. I may give this a shot in the future, but it doesn't really feel like it's quite there yet. Um, the UI feels a little bit uh, clunky, but uh, I really haven't given that a fair shake yet. So um, take a look, um, see if it, if it does what you need. And to mention one final example, uh, there's Fari, which is um, focused on fate, where things like index cards are more important than maps. Um, I know people are also using it successfully with Cortex Prime, which you know, has a similar DNA. Uh, I haven't spent time with it. At first glance, I haven't been able to figure out the UI, but um, you know, I'm sure once you get through the, uh, the tutorial or, or docs, uh, that should all be pretty straightforward. And um, I, yeah, I can see why an app like this would be a good tool for, uh, for uh, games like, like Fate. Or so let's talk a little bit about why I sometimes prefer to play without a VTT. Clearly, there are some really nice apps out there. If that's the case, why not simply pick one of them and use it for everything? The biggest reason for me is that I tend to prefer theater of the mind gameplay. So I don't really need most of the features that VTTs provide. I don't need battle maps, tokens, and certainly not fancy lighting and fog of war that takes into account walls and stuff like that. I actually tried out playing with these elements and found that they distract from the experience I want. I talk a bit about this in my previous video. Less is more here, in my opinion. I prefer to describe the scene and let players imagine things themselves. Removing constraints like exact distances can also help generate more creative combat action. Otherwise, it tends to be, I move and roll to attack. And setting these scenes up can be pretty involved and time consuming. I spend time fighting the application's UI instead of on the game itself. All of that time can instead go into preparing the campaign and adventure itself, whether it's homebrew or a module. And while my overall preference for theater of the mind is the main reason, there are other reasons why it might make sense for your group to try playing without a VTT. Some VTTs offer significant automation, for example, you might trigger a particular dice roll and the VTT might not just roll the dice, but also interpret and apply the results. While this may be convenient, it can get in the way of actually engaging with the game mechanics. Instead, it can feel like you're playing a video game. And while I love video games as well, when playing tabletop RPGs, I want to engage with the actual game mechanics. I want to roll the dice, look at the results that come up and figure out what to do with these. Aside from that, VTTs can be buggy or suffer from performance issues, a problem especially for users on less powerful hardware. They can also require a significant learning curve for players. And there's no single perfect VTT for all games. D&D 5e is usually supported pretty well, but if your group enjoys playing a variety of RPGs, you may find that not all games work well in your VTT of choice. So you may find yourself either accepting a less than ideal experience for a particular game or bouncing around between several VTTs, putting more strain on your group. It's also simply one more thing to coordinate. Make sure that everyone has the right URL, resolve connection issues that may come up, etc. 
Of course, cost can be an issue as well. Last not least, a game might simply not be supported at all by your VTT of choice. This can be the case especially for indie or niche games. While some VTTs have generic game support, getting this working in practice can be difficult, especially if the game uses a non-standard dice mechanic. It's good to have a fallback option in these cases. So let's talk about some alternatives. What do we really need for a typical RPG? We need voice, video, and text chat. We need dice rolling, character sheets, a place to track notes and other info such as party loot, and a way to share occasional maps or other images. Most of these checkboxes can be checked by Discord, my chat software of choice. It's really easy to set up private servers and invite your group. There are many ways to structure your server. You really just need one text chat room and one video chat room, but you may end up creating separate rooms for each campaign, for example, to keep things nice and tidy. In addition to chat, sharing occasional images or maps is easy by simply dragging them to the chat room. So for example, if I want to share a map with the players, I can just drag it into Discord and hit enter and it'll show up here and your players can click on it and look at the bigger version, opening, open it up in the browser or whatever they want to do with it. So that's pretty nice. Uh, and of course, there are plenty of other apps like Zoom, Google Meet, uh, or Slack that could be alternatives to Discord. So pick whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, I do like Discord uh, also because it has excellent support for bots, including many dice bots. My favorite dice bot is Rolem uh, because it doesn't require any special syntax. So for example, if I simply type something like d20, it'll roll it for me. So here we have a 10, or I could do, you know, d10 plus five, and, you know, it'll just do that. There's a bunch of other syntax as well, right? So I can roll multiple dice and, and keep the highest one or the lowest to simulate things like advantage or disadvantage in 5e. Uh, so you can read the help page for, for more info, but Rolem is, is highly recommended. It's super easy and works well for most games. Um, some games really benefit from specialized bots, uh, such as Cortex Pal 2000 for Cortex Prime, for example. So I have that bot uh, installed here, and, and I did recently use it for a Cortex game, and, and I think it works great. Um, so here, for example, I can do slash roll, and uh, with Cortex, you end up rolling dice pools that can consist of all kinds of dice of different different sizes and so on. So for example, I might be rolling, you know, a d10 and two d8s and a d6 and maybe a d4 as well, right, in a single die roll. And I can simply type the numbers in here. I don't need any, again, any, any fancy syntax. And I hit enter and uh, it both shows me the individual die rolls, right? So my d4 came up with a four, my d8s came up three and two and so on. Uh, and it has a little bit of convenience built in, which you can actually turn on or off. Um, Cortex has this core mechanic where you roll your dice and then you add up any two of those dice for the total. Typically you want to take the two best ones, but there are reasons why you sometimes want something different. So it basically tells me the best total would be nine by adding up the five and the four uh, with effect die. So that's the highest die size that remains after that of d10. Um, so it sort of helps you interpret this a little bit. Um, so it's, you know, it's not quite as nice as rolling physical dice, it makes it a lot more tactile, um, but it gets the job done. And um, there are plenty of other dice bots out there that work well for, for games that have special um, dice mechanics, like um, the 2D20 system, for example, has a nice dice bot that we use in our ongoing Fallout game. Uh, it helps count successes and complications and stuff like that. D&D 5e has the Avray bot, which um, was actually purchased by D&D Beyond, which now belongs to Wizards of the Coast. So that has a very deep integration with D&D Beyond, in fact. Um, so you can um, 
connect to your character sheets that you've created in D&D Beyond and refer to your character's abilities and equipment when, when making rolls through the Discord dice bot. Uh, and again, there are many, many other good dice bots. And for that matter, if players want to roll physical dice, I'm totally fine with that as well. After all, as gamers, we love our shiny polyhedrals, and I trust my players not to cheat. There are some games, though, where it can be really helpful for everyone to see the results of the dice roll. Cortex Prime is another example here, where it's really helpful for everybody to see the ones, for example, that come up and might represent hitches or opportunities and, uh, and so on. And so for those types of games, I ask everybody to, to use the dice bot um, so we can all see the results. So that's dice. That leaves character sheets and a place to track other info. And my go-to solution here is Google Sheets. I've designed many sheets myself for games like Cortex, Warlock, Fallout, and DCC. So let me show you a couple of examples real quick. Here's the character sheet for my homebrew Cortex Prime game, which I'm calling Zombies of the Caribbean. So it's kind of a zombies versus pirates themed game. I think this came out pretty well. Um, I actually think it looks kind of uh, engaging. I like the color scheme. It's kind of got that marine kind of kind of colors. Uh, it actually works pretty well when you print it as well. Uh, it's a little small, but uh, it's it's uh, workable. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty easy to just, you know, track everything you need on here. Um, so I find this very, very usable. Here is a character sheet that I did a little bit earlier for Warlock. This one it looks a little bit more crude, but uh, again, it gets the job done. Uh, all the info you need is on here. Uh, I also made a ton of pregens. Um, that's super convenient when I run online games. I can just copy the sheet and I have my pregens for, for everybody to, to pick from. Let's show one more. This is a sheet I made for uh, Fallout. Uh, and actually, a friend made some further improvements to this. Um, so here, um, again, it looks pretty much like the regular Fallout um, character sheet. You got your uh, your attributes and skills. You got your um, hit location chart. Um, you can track if you're injured. You got uh, ammo and gear and all all the usual things you need. So those are just a couple of examples of uh, of sheets. But you can also find ready-made sheets for many games online. What's nice about sheets is that you can add tabs for other info, such as loot or various notes, even maps and images. And you can also leverage simple formulas to simplify things. So for example, the target for a Fallout dice roll is typically the sum of a skill and its associated attribute. So we can simply calculate the sum, right? So if we look at, um, say, speech and the governing attribute is charisma, so my charisma is eight, my speech is five, so I could do the math every time and end up at 13, but, uh, you know, we just toss the formula in here. So we don't have to do that uh, every single time. So that's just a little bit of a convenience that I think is, uh, uh, is worthwhile. Uh, and as you um, gain skill ranks, uh, this automatically gets updated. So it's also one less thing to, to maybe forget about um, updating. So just little uh, quality of life improvements. And of course, aside from Google Sheets, there are many other options um, that fulfill a similar purpose. Uh, you could use Google Slides, perhaps give every player one slide to track their stuff. Uh, you could let players use PDFs, either online, maybe shared via Google Drive or Dropbox or something, or just offline. Um, although as a GM, I do find it helpful to be able to see each player's sheet. Or even other options that you might not even think of for RPGs. So for example, I've used Trello, which is a card-based project management tool uh, for Fate in the past, because Fate is also heavily based on cards, on index cards. So I figured this might work pretty well. So here's what the Trello board looks like for this uh, Dresden Files accelerated game that I ran you know, five years or so ago. Um, 
So uh, there's many, many ways that you could structure this, right? In this case, we have a column for each character and it has uh, all the information. So their, their name and background and skills, uh, it has all their aspects. So kind of a good place to track all of this stuff, right? Their uh, stunts gives you a way to add a, a portrait for each character. Um, and then over to the right, we have some scene aspects. Like there's a, there was a holy mist here at some point in this scene, uh, game aspects. There's plot info that, that we were tracking here um, just to keep track of stuff. I threw some NPCs in here that, that came up in the game, monsters. Uh, I have all, a bunch of factions in here, like the cult of Hecate, uh, locations, uh, like Portington's Market and St. Catherine's Docks, uh, Battersea Park was, a, was an important location in our game. You can have session logs, and then of course you can click on these, right, and see more details. So yeah, you can toss all kinds of stuff in here. In the background, we have a nice uh, thematic image of uh, London, which is where our Dresden Files game was set. So this was actually a, a, a pretty good tool in conjunction with with Discord. And you know, you probably have your own favorite productivity tools. So chances are that uh, your favorite tool may be a decent solution for RPGs as well. So there you have it. Discord plus Google Sheets is my go-to solution these days, but I'm always interested in exploring other options. But when I run some published adventure modules, especially dungeon crawls, I do like to show an overhead map and gradually reveal this via Flock of War as the characters explore it. That's when I jump to a VTT like Foundry. That's it for now. Why don't you leave a comment to let me know your favorite solution for playing games online? And as always, likes and subscribes are appreciated as well. Thank you and see you next time.